This weekend, a TikTok video showing a man lighting a fire inside of an aircraft toilet to make himself a nice hot meal went absolutely viral. And when it did, safety organizations and airlines out there went absolutely ballistic. And the TikToker who did this video had to withdraw it. Now, why did the airlines and the safety organizations react this way? Today, we're going to be talking about the absolutely terrifying prospect of an in-flight fire and why that is the ultimate nightmare for anyone who's involved in this business. You're very welcome to the Mentor Pilot channel. I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic and stay tuned. <laughs> Okay guys, so this whole thing started with a TikToker um, whose name we're not going to mention or show. Um, we've gotten permission to show part of his video from him um, because we're doing this in the name of safety. So this person um, is basically complaining about the fact that there are no hot meals available on board aircraft anymore. So he proceeds to go into the toilet and uh, take out what looks like a little uh, alcohol candle put it inside of the toilet bowl and take out a um, aluminium tray, light the candle on fire, putting the tray on top, proceeding to cook his steak with a little bit of wine and some salad with it. All right. And then we'll see him going back out into the cabin to eat his meal. Right. Now, Initially, if you, if you don't know anything about in-flight fires, you might think that this is innocent enough. Obviously, it's hilarious, isn't it? The fact is, though, that, first of all, this video is completely fake. Um, the TikToker wasn't that stupid. He was using a, uh, a very cleverly hidden uh, LED light on the underside of the little tray. He never lit anything on fire inside of the toilet. And he used uh, a piece of pre-cooked meat in order to do this prank video, right? The problem here though is that people might think that this is true and some out of all of the hundreds of thousands of people who saw this might actually think that well that was a great idea, I have to try that. And this is why everyone went ballistic because the prospect of someone trying to light anything on fire inside of an aircraft toilet or anywhere inside of an aircraft cabin is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Now, I am telling you this because of my background as an airport firefighter. Before I became a pilot, I actually worked both during my military service and also a few years after that as an airport firefighter. And we, we used to train on you know how to handle smoke-filled cabins, for example, and how to handle a, a fire on board an aircraft. Now, what you have to understand is that in order for you to have a fire of any sort in any place, you need a couple of components. You need oxygen, you need heat, and you need fuel. Together, these forms what we call the triangle of fire. And that triangle of fire works the same way if you need to get rid of the fire. If you remove one of these three things, then the fire stops. And inside of a cabin, a cabin is a very special environment because it is completely and hermetically closed up. And it's being fed with air in order to pressurize the cabin. So you do have this closed up environment. Inside of it, you have all sorts of plastics and rugs, and things that could potentially be, uh, be fuel for fire if it's you know, being heated up enough. All of the things inside of, a, of an aircraft cabin is made to be fire retardant. But if the heat source is strong enough, nothing really is. Okay. Now, when we learned about you know, what would happen inside of a cabin as an airport firefighter, we actually built a mock cabin inside of one of these huge containers. So we put plywood inside of this metal container, both on the floor and on the walls and in the ceiling. Uh, and then we sat down on the floor and we lit a little fire in one of the corners just to learn what would happen. And what ensued to happen was that that little fire 
you could see it clearly. It's just like you think about a campfire, you know, a little fire in a corner, and then that produces smoke. The smoke it goes up into the ceiling, and then the smoke starts coming down from the ceiling. The more smoke that goes up, the lower the smoke comes. And so we had to constantly put our heads down more and more in order to be able to see the fire. Eventually that's not possible because the smoke will actually go down all the way down onto the floor. Now if that happens inside of an actual aircraft cabin, that's where the real danger holds because there's going to be so much poisonous fumes in here, burning plastic, stuff like that, that actually in most cases it's the smoke that is going to hurt or kill most people. But anyway, we were sitting there and eventually we were sitting in complete blackness. You cannot imagine how dark it becomes. You cannot see even your hand in front of the visor. We were sitting in full firefighting equipment. You could not see anything, but you could hear the fire. You could hear the, the crackling going away. All right. Now, eventually, the concentration of fuel, which is the black smoke, that's actually unburned material in the smoke. That's why it's so black. You know, that combines with heat from the fire and the uh, oxygen from outside and you get this perfect mixture. And when that happens, the only thing you hear is woof. And suddenly everything burns, all right? You cannot imagine this sight. This is what we call a flashover. And you have flames coming out in front of your face. Like they're coming out of midair. They're being created and they disappear and then you have flames in other places around you. You're surrounded by fire. That is a flashover. And in fact, when we were doing this experiment, uh, some of our firefighting visors started crackulating from the heat because the heat burnt up to hundreds of degrees within seconds of the flashover happening and we had to get out. Now, if a flashover would be allowed to happen in an aircraft, that would be it, All right? It, it's a non-survivable event. And this is why a fire on board is such a terrifying prospect. And we do have very stringent kind of procedures. Now, I'm not gonna go into the details of the cabin crew procedures, but basically they take different roles depending on who finds the fire, where the fire is. One will be fighting the fire. That's normally the one who finds it, all right? They need to get their fire gloves on, their PBE, which is portable breathing equipment on. But the, the main thing is that it needs to be fought, right? It needs to be fought immediately. The second one is going to become the communicator that speaks to the captain to let the captain know that this is going on, where it is and how bad it is. Then you have a third one that's going to be the backup that you know, gathers up all of the firefighting equipment and brings it to the place. And then you have one who's doing crowd control, who is getting the passengers out away from the fire, instructing them to keep themselves low, to use maybe a, a wet cloth over their face and try to stay away from breathing the fumes and just trying to control panic, really. Okay, so, the, this firefighting will be going on and it's going to happen as quickly as possible because the earlier you can find a fire and fight it, the better it is, right? The cabin crew are really trained in these kind of maneuvers and everyone who's part of an operating flight crew is going to be trained at this recurrently, you know? Every three years you have to go in and you have to actually fight fire as part of being a flight crew, both pilots and cabin crew. Anyway, the pilots, as soon as we hear that there's a fire on board, even if it's in an oven or wherever it might be, I am going to try to get as much information as I can. To where it is, how bad is it, how is the firefighting going? Okay, as soon as I know what's going on, then I'll come in, I'll brief my colleague, and then we're going to go for the smoke, fire, fumes, non-normal checklist. The first point on that checklist says diversion might be needed, okay? That is because this is one of those events where the time is not on your side. The longer it takes for you to decide where to, to divert and how to do it, the worse it's going to be. So essentially, we're going to divide the roles now where the pilot flying is going to be just aiming the aircraft towards a runway. Okay, we find the closest available airport, we call out a mayday immediately saying that we have a fire on board, and then we aim towards an airport that we can land at. While the pilot flying is doing this, setting up the aircraft for approach, 
getting him or herself ready. The pilot monitoring will be dealing with the checklist and the checklist is basically trying to uh, isolate a fire source. So it looks into whether it might be an electrical fire or it might be smoke coming out of the air conditioning system. And step by step, you remove power from certain parts of the aircraft in order to hopefully stop the fire from going on. As part of that checklist, you also have a smoke removal checklist. And it says in the checklist that whenever smoke becomes the greatest threat, then you go to the smoke removal checklist. And that's because if this fire continues and they're fighting it, but they can't really control it and we have that smoke coming down then you need to get it away from the passengers and the way to do that is basically by opening the outflow valve you're depressurizing the aircraft and that will suck all the smoke towards the outflow valve and that will clear up the air problem though is that that might also mask a fire source as in it might be harder to know where the fire is if it's hidden behind the panel um, and it might also actually bring more oxygen toward the fire so it could make it worse and this is why you only want to do this when smoke becomes a really really bad factor and this is also why the one who's doing a checklist needs to be talking to the communicator like the pilot needs to talk to the cabin crew to see how the, it's progressing you know what they are doing in the, in the cockpit if they're turning off a component for example is things getting better you know is the smoke disappearing is the fire disappearing and this is tricky because it's going to be, with, you know, it's not going to be instantaneous. If you turn off something and that is actually the cause of the fire, it's going to take a few seconds or even minutes potentially before that can be noticed. So communication between the pilots and the cabin crew is absolutely crucial here. Okay. So now you have one pilot concentrating on trying to get the aircraft done on the ground as quickly as possible. The other one is doing the checklist, trying to do this as best as possible. Hopefully the cabin crew are dealing with the fire and they, they manage to get it under control and the passengers are not panicking too much and they're away from the fire and no one is getting hurt. Right? This is best case scenario. Worst case scenario is that the cabin crew loses control of the fire. They're using their firefighting equipment, which is primarily still halon extinguishers, which works by removing the oxygen from the triangle of fire. Uh, we also have water glycol in case we need to cool something down. And once again, they are very trained in what and how they're supposed to use these things. But if they lose control of the fire, so they've used up all of their firefighting equipment, for example, or it is spreading quicker than they can handle it. If that is being communicated to us as flight crew, we know that we now have between 10 and 20 minutes before you have a potential flashover in the back. And that is not a lot of time to get the aircraft down, landed and evacuate safely. And this is why it actually says in the checklist, and this is one of the only places you'll find in the quick reference handbook, where the checklist tells you if they lose control of the fire, consider an off field landing. Basically, Get the aircraft down on the ground or on water. If you're out of the sea, potential ditching. If you're over ground but there's no airport around, find a good field, put the aircraft down and evacuate. Because getting the aircraft down on the ground, getting the emergency exits open and getting as many people as possible out is better in any case than flying on too long and letting this drift towards a flashover in the cabin. Okay, now you can see from how I'm reacting here and from how I'm telling you this, how bad of a situation this actually is. This is by far the worst situation. If you ask any pilot out there, what's the worst situation that you can think of? They're going to say an in-flight fire, right? M at least 95% is going to say that. And this is because of the timing, the, the panic, the smoke, remember that you, we might have to put oxygen masks on as well. Uh, if the smoke enters into the, the cockpit, well then we are obviously going to need to be able to breathe. So we put oxygen masks on, it's hard to communicate. Uh, the, the, the cabin crew is going to be struggling in the back trying to do this. So this is a really, really bad situation. And this is why we don't like seeing people doing joke videos about lighting stuff on fire inside of aircraft toilets. There's a reason why smoking was banned on board. And this is the reason for that. All right. So even if 
this was obviously a fake video. The off chance that someone would think that it isn't and try to replicate it or try to make their own version of this video is bad enough to go out with a video like this and to warn people against it. Do not attempt this. Now, prior to making this video, I also contacted EASA, all right, the European Aviation Safety Agency, and asked them if they had anything that they wanted to say as well. And they said that on top of really emphasizing the point that do not use any type of fire source inside of any compartment in a commercial aircraft at any point, they also really wanted to point out the new risks that are coming with the use of battery-driven equipment. Specifically, power banks, e-cigarettes, and new batteries to old mobile phones. As in, if you've exchanged your battery on your iPhone, but you haven't used a proper iPhone battery, there is a higher risk of a thermal runaway in those type of batteries, all right? And a thermal runaway is a scary thing, all right? It's a very explosive type of fire. It kind of feeds itself. It's very hard to get rid of. And this is the reason why you're not allowed to keep spare batteries, for example, lithium ion batteries, stuff like that in your checked in luggage in the hold of the aircraft. Right? If you're carrying those kind of things, first of all, you have to make sure that they're not too big and that they are allowed to keep. There's going to be lists of what type of batteries you're allowed to take on the aircraft in the first place. And if you do, make sure that you have them on your person or in your hand luggage. But they really wanted to emphasize that in the case of e-cigarettes, for example, and power banks, do not charge your e-cigarettes with your power bank. Do not charge anything if you can avoid it in, inside of the aircraft, okay? So if you're carrying these kind of things, try to keep them close to you so that you have them under check all the time. So in case a battery would be damaged, for example, or start one of these thermal runaways, at least you see it early and you can notify the cabin crew who have procedures to deal with this. The, you don't really want to have it inside of a hat bin because then it might actually cause a fire that is much more severe before any countermeasures can be taken. So do keep this in mind, you know, try to not use these kind of devices on board an aircraft. In any case, do not put them in your checked-in baggage and make sure that you're only using proper, good brands with these kind of things, all right? The cheaper they are, special replacement batteries and stuff, the higher the risk is that they haven't been properly tested and that they could actually cause a fire like that. So that's basically all I have about in-flight fires, guys. And as you can see, it would be a truly terrifying event. But having said that, and having now thoroughly scared you, I have to say as well that the procedures that we have and the safeguards that we have in place and the training that we receive is of the absolute highest level. And this is why we want you to know about this, right? It's not to scare you, it's to show that we are aware of these threats, that we take these threats very, very seriously, and we're doing everything that we can to safeguard you whenever you go out flying. Now I'm guessing that you guys have questions about this uh, and if you do then file them into the uh, questions and discussions below in the comments but also if you want to have a really like fulfilling discussion with other people who are interested in aviation, me for example, then I have now given you access to my discord server. Up until now my discord server has only been available for my patreons and for people who have joined through my website mentorpilot.com. But I've decided to give you know, access to everyone because I want to have as much fun discussions as possible. So if you go into the, um, the description of this video, you'll see that there's an invite link there. You just click that link, uh, fill in the username that you want to use and start chatting away. Now, the higher echelons of my Discord server is still only available for my Patreon. But if you want access to that, you can become a Patreon. If you don't, does not matter, we still want you in there. It will be great to see you all there. I also, before we go guys, I want to mention that last week's sponsor, NordVPN, is still available. I have the deal available here for you if you want to start protecting yourself and your data on the internet today. Uh, 
if you use the link down in the description, then you'll get a whopping 68% off the original price on their deals. And they might also throw in some extra free months and stuff into there. So go and check out the link if you want a great VPN to start protecting yourself. Have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are and I'll see you next time. Bye bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.